For our meeting tonight, uh, the two words that we're going to take up this evening are the words poor and rich, poor and rich. Um, those have been, uh, you'd say, have those, have those, been po those have been popular words since the beginning of time. Uh, and uh, if they've only been divisive in societies and kingdoms, uh, it doesn't matter where you turn. There is not a place on earth that does not have a divide between poor and rich. We're going to discuss that tonight, and I'm going to read one verse in our New Testament. It's one of the only verses that tells us about our Lord Jesus in very distinct words as to his financial, or uses these financial terms to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to turn to that verse with me, it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. So I'm going to take up the word poor tonight. And in the second half, in the latter 15 minutes of this message, Matt is going to speak on the word rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9, these are the words of the Apostle Paul, and he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. We'll read it one more time. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. We ask that God would bless the reading of his word tonight. You know, poverty is something that is often talked about, but uh, and it's dealt with. It has caused a number of, 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 not a number, it's caused a, a tremendous amount of pain and sorrow in this world, and um, it it's continues to, to linger on in, in almost every continent, every society, and yet to speak about it tonight from the words of Scripture is something else, uh, so significant tonight. When we think of individuals, we, we love to hear the stories of rags to riches, rags to riches. Uh, I think uh, one of the great stories of rags to riches, if, if anybody's familiar, there's the man who I uh, was the co-founder of the company Oracle and born on the Lower East Side after World War II um, in poverty. And today, I think he's estimated to be worth somewhere around $36.2 billion. You'd say these stories, they, they give us such hope, rags to riches. We love those stories. And on the other side, we have just the same stories of riches to rags. I think it was said of the great boxer, Mike Tyson, that in his career, he made well over half a billion dollars. And yet, it was just a few years ago that he filed for bankruptcy. You say you couldn't spend that money if you tried. Well, someone did. And yet, here we have an account of a man who didn't go from riches to rags or rags to riches, but had riches, and yet became poor, and he still had the riches. He never lost them. We're going to discuss that tonight in this verse. And it's so significant to talk about this because you might have heard a message from the Bible before that could tell you that God wants you to be rich. God wants you to have money. God bless you if you do. Do something good with it. But if you don't, God bless you even if you have nothing tonight because God does not care if your bank account has a penny in it or if it has a billion dollars in it. I tell you, God could care less. What God cares about is this. It's not the number written in your bank account, but whether or not your name is written in heaven's vault. Is your name in the place where they use gold as asphalt? Is your name in the place where they take pearls and make them into doors? That's the question tonight. Not what you have here in this world, because you'll leave it all behind. What do you have that you will take beyond the grave? What do you have that can get you past, that can get you past the point of death? Because money can't. Thank God we have this verse that tells of someone who became poor for us. We would have riches untold one day. The Bible says, where your riches is, lay them up in heaven, because where your riches are, your heart will be there too. You don't want your heart to be in some vault downtown. You want your heart to be in heaven above where your Savior is, to believe what he says here, the Apostle Paul, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, grace is just getting what you don't deserve. That's salvation, getting what you don't deserve. If, if anybody's ever gotten a paycheck and you've opened it up and gone, I don't deserve that. Rarely, rarely does it happen. To a few people, every once in a while it does. You say, 
you know, I don't deserve that. I, I cut out of work four hours early this week. I don't deserve that. When it comes to payment, we're always glad to get what we get on Friday because we deserve it. But in Grace's terms here, we are getting something we don't deserve at all. If you're saved today and someone asks you if you deserved it, you say, I won't deserve it now, nor will I deserve it a million years from now. But God saves sinners because of his grace. In fact, the Bible says it's the riches of his grace. And uniquely here, the Apostle Paul, he says, though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. What does that mean? What does it mean when he uses those words of, of being rich and poor? You know, the Lord Jesus, when he was born, was born to two very poor people. And when he died, he was buried by two very wealthy individuals. And so his life saw the spectrum of rich and poor. But what do these words mean when it tells us about Christ that he was rich? but he became poor. You know, the Bible tells us about Jesus Christ. He was the one who created everything. He called stars out into existence. He formed this globe. He divided the waters with land masses. You say creation attests to the fact that he is its creator. He's the one who the Bible says had a cattle on a thousand hilltops. The gold was his, the silver was his. Everything was his. You know, the stoop to which he took, he became poor. Sometimes if, if you've never had money, poverty might not be too painful. But if you had it and then you became poor, you'd say you'd know the difficulty. Bible tells us everything was his. All things were made by him and all things were made for him. And yet we read about the Lord Jesus Christ in the 33 years that he was here. He borrowed a place to be born. He borrowed boats to preach from. He borrowed food. He borrowed pennies. He borrowed a place to have a meal. He borrowed uh, transportation. He borrowed a tomb. His whole life, borrowing. He had nothing for his own. In fact, the Bible goes to such a length that we read the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 8, and verse 20, and it says, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, he has no place to lay his head. That's real poverty. Poverty, that the God of heaven became a man, became a man and suffered more than any other man. But this is the great part of his poverty. It says, though he was rich, yet for our sakes, he became poor. What is it about this poverty? What, what do we get? Because obviously wealth to poverty means this. He had to give something away. He had to give. Because giving is the only thing, giving or spending, but the money has to go somewhere. We, we read about men like Warren Buffett, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Bill Gates, and, and every year they give, they give, and they give. They give so much money. It's astounding the amount of money they give to schools, to charities, to countries, to, to individuals. You'd say the amount of money they give is more money than some countries will, will gather in their whole year. And yet when they give, they just give a percentage. I, I would beg to think that none of them give more than 1% of what they're worth. When Jesus Christ came into the world, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, he gave something that was of infinite value. What did he give? He gave his life. He gave his life on a cross. He gave his life there at Calvary. And you'd say, though he was rich, he gave everything. Show me a man who's prepared to give everything. And I will say this. I will say, show me what he's willing to give it for. Show me a man or a woman. You'd say, they emptied their bank account. They wrote a check out and included everything they had. They left their entire fortune to someone or to something else. And I'll say, I want to see what it was done for. Because that will tell me about that man. Jesus Christ gave everything. And you'd say, why? Well, I can show you one individual. You're looking at him. You say, not much of a reason. And I would agree with you tonight. Not much of a reason. But it's because of grace. I never deserved it. Anybody who's saved tonight can say it's through his poverty. You say, poverty never gives anything to anyone. Poverty never does anything for anybody else. Poverty is what brings us down. Poverty is what destroys society. Poverty is what stunts education. Poverty is what caused hunger. Poverty is what destroys nations. Poverty. And yet here, 
maybe the only time in history we have a poverty that makes people rich. It was a poverty when Jesus Christ gave his life at Calvary. You say it's unparalleled in giving, but his poverty, we become rich. Here's the man who gave his life. The, the apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1 says this, we have not been purchased, redeemed, he says. We haven't been redeemed with, with corruptible, flimsy things like silver and gold. You can almost hear his, his humor. We haven't been redeemed with these things like silver and gold that we count so precious, that we were purchased with a man's life, with the precious blood of Christ. What about you? You're worth tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ said a soul was worth more than the whole world. What will it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's a poverty that is unparalleled, to lose your soul. You want to know what the richest thing you could do tonight is to trust Christ and to lose your sin, not lose your soul. Lose the debt. Lose the debt that sin has caused and gain the wealth of heaven. When you gain Christ, it was his poverty to take Christ, he says here. This Jesus Christ, grace, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty, poverty, you know, at the end of his life, many people know, if you've ever heard the story of Jesus Christ, he was exchanged at the end of his life. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver. It was the same price tag that could be used to purchase slaves in that day. It was the equivalent maybe today of, of, of just a couple hundred bucks. 30 pieces of silver were used to exchange Jesus Christ. You know, in all truth, he was exchanged for something more or less. He was exchanged for something much less. Because when Jesus Christ became poor, when he took on humanity and he went to Calvary and he died, it was him for me. He was exchanged for me. It was his righteousness. His righteous life was given for my sinful soul. You see, I'm going to heaven one day. I don't know when that day is going to be, but I guarantee you my passport's stamped. I know I'm going to be there. I guarantee you I'll be there. You say, how do you know? You see, because the man who built the place told me. The man who built the place has written in his word that it's through his poverty that I am made rich because you can't take your 401k with you. You can't take your cars. You can't take your house. You can't take your bank account. You can't take it. You can't take it with you. If you want to invest in something in this life, you invest in the poverty of this man. And you'll have something that is unparalleled in the riches of this world. You'll have salvation, the forgiveness of sins peace with God. You say, is it really worth having? Yes, because at best we exist in this world for what, 80 or 90 years. What does it amount to? At the end of this life, if I don't ever make a million, it will not matter. I will be forgotten almost a couple years after I pass away. And yet heaven has made record of my soul and its salvation because I realized a man who was rich became poor and I recognized it was his poverty when he gave everything he had. And I asked myself, why? Why did he give it? Why did he do that? Why was heaven's vault emptied? Why was heaven's bank account? Why was one giant check made out at Calvary? It was done to purchase me, to purchase sinners, the ungodly, sinners, those who were in the debt far above any debt on this world. And yet here was a man who paid it all. His poverty. We have riches. The riches of his grace, the Apostle Paul could say. We don't deserve it. It's like getting a paycheck for, for the end of the week and you never worked a day in your life. You'd say, I would hate that. You know, so would I. So would I. I'd hate to get a paycheck one day for not ever having worked. I, I, think, I think it would make me feel like less of an individual. But realize today, realize tonight, if you want to work for heaven, you'll never be there. Heaven is a gift. Forgiveness of sins is a gift. It's offered because one man paid everything. The riches of this man. He became poor doing it. And it's his poverty that guarantees me one day I'll be with him. Listen, as Matt continues to tell you 
about the riches of this man, Jesus Christ, and how you can know your sins forgiven. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're going to read uh, in Ephesians in chapter 2 uh, and verse 4. So if you're tracking along, uh, we're going to read from our Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Very important to pay attention to those words if you're uh, not saved today, or maybe you're thinking you're going to heaven through some works. The writer here is saying, by grace, you're saved. It's not of any work of your own. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's all we're going to read this evening. I got a note just recently uh, from a dear brother who mentioned these words on email as he was text or e emailing me. He said, uh, it's thrilling as he's listening to the messages online. He said, it's thrilling to see two believers enjoying speaking about the person of Christ. I, I would tell you, uh, you can't help it, quite frankly. If someone gave me on this earth and someone gave you perhaps $10 million and you you all of a sudden went from perhaps poverty or some level of maybe even middle class, and all of a sudden you had $10 million, you'd be absolutely thrilled. If someone gave me that type of money, I'd tell the world about that person. But there's someone who we're speaking about tonight, the person of Christ, and we love to shout his name from the rooftops. Jesus Christ gave us much more than any man could ever offer uh, on this side of heaven. And so Dave opened with these words of 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 8 and verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he's rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. I love the fact that he opened with that verse because in its context, Paul's perhaps positively commenting to these Corinthian believers on their good works and maybe exposing motive. Perhaps, maybe someone founded pride in their generosity or maybe he's writing to them to encourage them to have some explosion of grace within their community. But here Paul's saying this as he's comparing and trying to get believers' attention. He's saying, though Jesus was rich beyond all measure for your sakes, he becomes poor so that you through his poverty could make us eternally rich, the person of Christ through his poverty. Perfect divinity and divine nature in which dwells the fullness of the triune Godhead, yet he comes to earth absolutely sinless, in whom resides all the glorious, the infinite, the eternal attributes of God in their fullest measure, yet he's on this earth and he's sinless and he's spotless and he goes to a cross and he goes to a cross to die and to be buried and to rise again the third day just for you on the call today. Our minds can never conceive the infinite riches of the eternal Son of God and his majesty pre-cross existence. 61 years post-death of Christ, Paul's writing to a church called Colossae. And you see in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, he says, the Son, listen to the riches of Christ. He said the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, you say, well, how rich? The writer continues, all things were created through him and for him. And before that, in verse 13, he talks about our deliverance from the captivity of sin. In verse 13, Paul's writing says, he has delivered, Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The question sometimes goes out and people ask, well, What's redemption? What is it, this redemption through his blood? What is this, the forgiveness of sin? The word there in, in Greek is apolotrosis. It refers to the deliverance of an unbeliever from the payment of their sin, occurring nine times in scripture. It's the purchase back of something that has been eternally lost by a payment or a ransom. It's the debt of our sin. It's never canceled, but it's fully paid. And Dave touched on that. All of heaven paid for sin through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ's life, his blood, when he surrenders for humanity on a cross, the ransom by which we are delivered for serving sin's taskmaster and from its eternal consequence, an eternal separation from God, paid for by the blood of Christ. The Bible says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's an absolute tremendous thought. Christ never saved us, as Hodges' uh, theology states, Christ never saved us from the mere exercise of his power. 
Or he never saved us by coming to earth and speaking his doctrine and teaching and, and healing. Or maybe not by the positive, holy, moral influence he exerts and shows to humanity because he walked here sinless and spotless. He never swore, he never thought sin, he never acted with sin. Not by any subjective influence on his people, whether natural or supernatural. The one who was rich. But he saves us by this. He was a satisfaction to a divine justice. He satisfied God in the sacrifice of his person on an old rugged cross. He made amends or reparation for the guilt of wrongdoing or sin or that word atonement is used. He's as a ransom from the curse and the authority of the law. And now through the work of the cross, you say, well, why do you tell me all these things? Because that's the riches of Christ that some people on this call have come to understand through faith in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now he reconciles us to God when someone comes to trust Christ. He makes it consistent with his perfection to exercise mercy towards sinners. And he completed this, you say, where, Matt? All on a cross. The preaching of Christ is all about a cross. Hymn writer penned these words, Oh, the riches of my Savior, all embracing life and light, wisdom, power, healing, comfort, treasures, rich of God's delight. Oh, the riches of my Savior, who can know their breadth and length or their depth and height unmeasured, yet they are my joy and strength. Concerning the riches of Christ, Nehemiah writes these words in chapter 9 and verse 6. He says, You alone are the Lord. You created the heavens, the highest heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all that is in it, the seas, and all that is in them. You give life to all things, and the heavenly host worships you. If I took you in scripture, we backed up to where uh, he was before Christ ever stepped from eternity into time. You would see a story in the book of Isaiah as angels, as you just contemplate this thought just for a moment, angels worship him for all of eternity. Isaiah 6, as Isaiah is sitting there, and he sees these words as angels surround his person, and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. They worshiped him before he came. They worshiped him at his birth. We spoke about it yesterday. Glory to God in the highest, peace upon earth, and goodwill towards men. Yet at the cross, if you notice, angels are silent at Calvary. They're silent at Calvary. They announce his resurrection. You say, well, continue with the riches. Listen to Revelations chapter 5, if you like to see the riches of Christ. As Christ has the power and the riches to open a scroll when no one else can do it, and to loose its seven seals when no one else can do it, the riches of Christ, the power of Christ. Heaven here is weeping in Revelation chapter 5, a beautiful chapter, if you ever want to dive into it and really get some depth into who Christ is. And yet as they're weeping, because no one can open the scroll and loose its seven seals, it says Christ stands. And in the midst of the elders, it says, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. That's the person of Christ. And he takes the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne, the riches of Christ. Revelation 5 verse 9 says this, as living creatures and 24 elders, they prostrate as it were. They bow to him before Christ. They start to sing a new song. And these are the words that they sing. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. This is Christ. And has redeemed us or bought us back to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And has have made us, or the word there is them, which are believers, kings, or a kingdom, and priests to our God. And we, or the word there is they, shall reign on the earth, the riches of Christ. There's only one being, one person who could ever purchase our redemption. That's the person of Christ. And the writer continues in Revelation chapter 5, and he says, Then I looked. And I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 or 100 million plus beings and thousands of thousands. And they're saying with a loud voice, listen to the riches of Christ. You could know him today, dear friend. If you came to the cross just the way you are, him that comes to me, Jesus says, I'll never cast out. And he's calling the sinner to come and have a relationship with him. He that believes on the son, John 3 verse 36, has everlasting life and they cry out worthy is the lamb who is slain to receive power and riches and wisdom picture heaven saying these words as they amen this and strength and honor and glory and blessing you can re receive tonight you can receive eternal blessing sins forgiven past present sins future sins a home in heaven and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such are as in the sea and all that are in them i heard saying and it crescendos into worship of the king of kings and the lord of lords the riches of christ blessing 
and honor and glory and power to be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Then the four creatures said, amen. And the elders fall down and they worship him who lives forever and ever. The richest of Christ. Sometimes we sing a song. I'm going to tell you the story of it. There's a man by the name of James McGrangan, uh, from, born July 4th, 1840 in West Fallowfield, Pennsylvania. Died July 9th, 1907 in Kinsman, Ohio. He was a cultured American musician known for a rare tenor voice. He had a tremendous gift. He's urged by professionals as he's going through life in his mid-30s to pursue opera. He's dazzled by the prospects of fame and fortune. Are you dazzled by that tonight? Dave said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Philip Bliss, a dear friend of him, who's just two years older. James was 36. Philip was 38. And he had a similar talent, but he gave that talent to the Lord. He writes a letter to James as he's praying about what to write uh, because he notices that his friend James, although he's a Christian, he has a love for fame. And he's sort of being sideswiped by the pleasures of the world. And he prays. He's not sure how to communicate to James that he should give his life to the Lord's things. He sends a letter. And he says this, that he compared McGranahan's long, or James, long course of musical training to a man wetting his sith, which means a sith would have been a long curved blade at the end of a long pole used for cutting crops during a harvest. And he says these words as he ends his letter to him. He says, stop wetting the sith and strike into the grain to reap for the harvest. In other words, stop wasting time in the world and use your same skills and your same gifts and your perhaps exercise but for the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, stop, take your training that you've learned, and instead of giving it to the world, give it to Christ. He sends the letter. When James reads it, it starts to haunt him. And over again, and over and over and over again, he hears these words as it haunts his mind. Strike into the grain and reap for the master. Reap for the master. Reap for the master. In other words, live for Christ. One week later, from the day he receives the letter, the man who penned those words, Mr. Bliss, Philip Bliss, he died at the age of 38. There's a train that was bringing Bliss and his family from Pennsylvania to Chicago to sing at the Moody Tabernacle. And a train broke through the railroad bridge at Ashtabula, Ohio, and it plunged into a 60-foot chasm and caught fire. A hundred pe people perished, including Philip and his wife. James rushes to the scene of the accident. And as he's standing there, he realizes the brevity of life. And he decides, as a Christian, he's already saved. I tell you this, if there's a believer on the call today, and maybe you're saying, what's my purpose? You give your life to Christ. If you're not saved today, you give your life to Christ, and he'll show you your purpose. He decides to yield his life, his talents, all his service to the Savior. And as he's watching the fires that have engulfed his friend, he starts to pen this hymn. Listen to the hymn that he penned that day. Oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation, he has set me free. He that believes on the Son, says he, Christ, hath everlasting life. All my iniquities on him were laid. All my indebtedness by him was paid. All who believe on him, the Lord hath said, hath everlasting life. Though poor and needy, I can trust my Lord. Though weak and sinful, I believe his word. Oh, glad message, every child of God hath everlasting life. Though all unworthy, yet I will not doubt. For him that comes, he will not cast out. He that believes, oh, the good news shout, hath everlasting life. And the chorus says, he that believes on the Son, yes, it's true, has everlasting life. The riches of Christ, the unlimited storehouse of wealth to buy you back from the penalty and the condemnation of sin and bring you into the house of his riches. The world's riches, Dave mentioned a couple of these names. I was just reading uh, the island of Fiji uh, recently invited the world's richest to avoid COVID and to spend a, an entire quarantine on the island. Warren Buffett was one, 67.5 billion. Bernard Arlett and his family, 76 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, 78.6 billion. Bill Gates, 98 billion. Jeff Bezos, 113 billion. They're all invited. They had to spend millions just to be on this island, but they're invited. Tonight, you're being invited. You're being invited tonight to join the richest family that your mind will ever be able to understand. You will never understand what it, the riches of Christ this side of eternity. And God's inviting. He paid the debt. And it's free just for you. It costs God everything. God wants you to deliver you from the power of the enemy, to receive you under God's mercy, to justify you by faith or to be declared righteous. He redeems or purchases us from the slave market of sin. That's the riches of Christ. That's what we're talking about. Removes you from being condemned under grace, not under judgment. The believer me dead to the old life and alive unto God, free from the law. God offers this to the person of his Christ, the regeneration, the born spiritually into God's family. Peace with God. Trespasses all forgiven. A heavenly citizenship based on reconciliation. We're given access to God. No need to pray to a man. We have God access. We can pray right to him. We're reconciled by God and to God. And through Christ, we have light 
and guidance through life. The Holy Spirit indwells someone when they come to trust in Christ. An amazing body. Believers all over the world. And God invites you to that body. Adopted into God's family. Objects of his love. Objects of his grace. Objects of his power. His faithfulness. His peace. His consolation. His intercession. Objects of the riches of Christ. Eternally saved. And you can never lose it. And you're made complete and glorified in Christ. United in Christ. A member of his body. A branch in the vine, John 15 says. A stone in the building. and sheep in the flock, Ephesians said. Part of his bride, God's word said. A priest in his kingdom, God's word said. A saint of the new species, 2 Corinthians 5. And united with the Holy Spirit. Mark 8 said this, and I repeat what Dave said. Jesus speaking, he says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What did God give? God gave his son just for you. The son died on a cross just for you. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I quote, I end with a quote. Charles Spurgeon said this, the preaching of Christ is the whip that flogs the devil. The preaching of Christ is the thunderbolt, the sound of which makes hell shake. And simply this evening, we've sought with our failures just to show you just a little bit of Christ through the word of God. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he's rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Rich through being saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Thanks for being with us. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to make some just quick announcements.